Hi everyone and welcome to this evening's online discussion uh, exploring the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in our local communities across the globe. Uh, we're particularly excited to introduce our diverse participants this week joining. Uh, as last week we had a very similar topic but with a UK focus, this week we're looking at the pandemic on the global scale and, and how communities uh, are impacted. Our participants this week are joining again, as, as I said, from both here in the UK uh, and some from across the world who will share their own experiences uh, in their local communities, how they responded to the pandemic and provide their own personal uh, experiences and perspectives on, on the outbreak itself. Uh, this pandemic, once again, you know, from, from our, our globalised perspective, has helped to show and highlight the high level of interdependence that connects us all as individuals across the globe. The good degree of the both cooperation and solidarity needed at every level has been illustrated. So to stand strong against such phenomena now in our society, we're shown again that we're deeply interconnected and interwoven. With this in mind, our discussion will aim uh, to find, find some sort of a common ground and common understanding of where perhaps we can work together as a whole if we were to face such an unfortunate and tragic challenge again in the future. Does our experiences with COVID-19 present us with vital lessons uh, that we should learn in this respect and, and implement in our own societies? So uh, we do have a long list of, of speakers today. So without holding it uh, any longer, I'd just like to briefly explore, explain the format. Uh, so each speaker will be given a, a 10 minute uh, slot to present their, their own views and opinions um, with room for brief comments and interactions with, between the speakers. Uh, and, and if we have any comments on our live chat on YouTube, we'll try to incorporate them in too. Uh, so feel free, uh, all our speakers to, to interact then too. Uh, followed by a collective discussion at the end. And again, if, if we do have a couple of questions on, on the chat on YouTube, we'll, we'll try and bring them in uh, again. We do hope to uh, finish strictly by 7 p.m. here in the UK, uh, as we have speakers from around the world. I know that some, some are still in their early morning hours, some are, some are in their late evening hours. So, so to uh, not hold them uh, much longer than, than needed. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our, our first speaker, Professor Anwar Alam, uh, a senior fellow with the Policy Perspectives Foundation, who has an interest and expertise in the area of international politics, Indian politics, politics in the Middle East, political theory, religion and politics, political Islam and Muslim societies. So, so Professor Alam, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Aisa, for this kind invitation. And uh, I'm, I'm very glad to participate on this uh, webinar, on this very vitally important topic, in fact. Uh, so this entire idea about this uh, community perspective, dealing with the challenges of the corona, I mean, coronavirus pandemic, in fact. Uh, uh, the first problem, probably, that I face with the very title of the topic is this that in the very cross-cultural understanding of community itself, actually, the way you understand community and the way probably we understand community. I think that there's a remarkable cultural understanding of the community in which the entire frame has been taking place. At. So what happened probably the Indian context is that, that even though we all know that this pandemic poses challenges to everybody, irrespective of any kind of identity, gender, caste, religion, any kinds of actually. But then the any notion of the community in the South Asian specific context is typically very local, in fact. I mean, we do not understand community in terms of probably the neighborhood, actually. You know? So if you look at from this point of view, what is going on at the moment in India is that there's a whole range of what has come to known as a Corona Jihad also. You know, so there's a remarkable politics in which a particular community has been basically blamed for a particular kind of organization, a hosting and the meeting and this and that. That's number one, actually. I wanted to put it that. The second thing which I would like to put across is that, that the way we are facing the challenges of this coronavirus, we are probably not facing much more in the whole question of health, actually. 
for us. Uh, the coronavirus has posed a very, very great challenges of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, probably the livelihood actually. The large number and probably the majority of the Indians participate in the informal economy. So wherever in terms of the neighborhood, probably the community corporations, and for example, it is much more concerned uh, with, with, with the whomever you can help with the money or with the food or with the shelters or with any other kinds of things actually. So our major concern is probably not those norms and the health norms and the safety measures. Or for example, for example, the safe distancing, or for example, what uh, it certainly is not there, but probably we would like to see, for example, livelihood maintenance of our domestic helper actually, livelihood maintenance of our driver actually, livelihood maintenance of uh, those students who have not paid the fees into the school actually, you know, the livelihood maintenance of probably the washerman actually. And this is where our concern is that. And what we see remarkably at the local level, so probably you are a part of the neighborhood society or for example, if related to integrated community actually, we are probably the largest number of the domestic helpers and the drivers and for example, the washermen probably for example, the gardener, all these people come. Uh, I see the large number of people actually cutting across any kind of religion or the caste, for example, any kind of the linguist community. They are certainly basically in the helping hand, that's for sure, actually. So even though they are no more working, but I see the money is going on voluntarily from here. So that's a remarkable. That's a major concern that we have, how to sustain lives, actually. So, I mean, we are at the moment very not very concerned. But in terms of, for example, the safety measures, because India is such a crowded place that it is actually extremely difficult to maintain any kind of social distancing. In fact, the whole logic of social distancing in India totally breaks down. If you look at, for example, the population in a metropolis, and probably everybody knows that what happened with the migrant labor in India, actually. You know, if you look at, for example, the cities like Mumbai, or for example, the Delhi, where we are placed in one room. Uh, almost 15 people, 15 liberal lives together, actually. So in a one room where the 15 working class and, and 15 liberal lives together, it is almost impossible to maintain any kind of the social distancing, actually, you know, no matter what you say, actually. So therefore, we find is that, that where the community cooperation has basically taken places in terms of, for example, religion, for example, for example, the caste, it's a basically the, in the informal sector, actually, how to extend help to those families who are really in dire need of the money and who are dire need of the foods actually, and who are dire need <clears throat> of maintaining the education. This is where I see the Indian cooperation is coming in a very big way. On the other hand, at a very national level, there is also the remarkable level of politics which is basically going on, where a one particular community has been basically blamed using Corona and, and as a threat to the other community. So there's a very bitter kind of the politics that is also going on blaming the particular community for the spread of uh, coronavirus and this and that. But at the same time, as I do mention to you is that, that as far as the community interaction and the cooperation and the helping at is concerned, at the local level is concerned, it is a more in terms of extending in the informal. Uh, I think this is the uh, uh, <clears throat> few things I wanted to put before you. As and when there'll be more questions, I'll certainly entertain them. No, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Alam, I mean, for, for highlighting, you know, the, the various groups of peoples and, and the livelihood, perhaps the socioeconomical uh, factors that, that sound surround the, the pandemic from an Indian context uh, and, and, you know, with a heavily populated country, how it's perhaps difficult to, to you know, implement such uh, policies suggested by the World Health Organization, such as social distancing. Uh, but, but you also touched upon the, the concept of how jihad is now being becoming involved and, and how biases and prejudices against certain groups are, are also, you know, perhaps actually becoming becoming worse during this pandemic period. Would, would you agree with that? I mean, is this something that, that was present before and, and is developing or is it uh, in the context this of- This is one of the powerful narratives here, unfortunately. And that the mainstream media is very much, if you look at, for example, the mainstream media, you basically see this title actually, Corona Jihad actually, you know. And what is this Corona Jihad is basically a kind of religious organization who hold a meeting actually, not much aware of the safety norms belonging to the particular Muslim community. And then the, the entire national media and the mainstream media, because the kind of the nationalisms that 
we are having at the moment, completely majoritarian kind of politics that is taking place. And therefore, they would like to e use each and every incident which is related with a particular kind of identity just to ensure a political polarization. So we see that, you know, at a national level that certainly is taking place. That's very unfortunate, actually, because the kind of challenges that we have, we probably demand a very kind of the robust cooperation along all kinds of identities. Mm -hmm. So that kind of cooperation does become visible, essentially at a much more local level. You know, when you actually know your driver, we actually know your domestic helper, we actually know your labor migrants, we actually know some people who are in Dan, but certainly not at the national level. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you very much. I mean, I think that those community dynamics, prejudices, uh, are perhaps something that we should bring into the discussion at the end when, when yeah, we compare sure. from, from uh, uh, a global perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, now we are on to our next speaker uh, from Italy, Professor Rudio. Bevento, sorry, I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing correctly, uh, from the University of Rome. Uh, he, so, he teaches social pedagogy, educational research methods, uh, and carries out research on early school leaving. Uh, so, so, Professor, the, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Isha. And um, tell me if it's possible to see something uh, as a movie. Otherwise, don't worry. But, okay, tell me during the, the speech. Okay, not at the moment. No, not at the moment. Yeah, I know, I know. It's not possible. So, thank you very much to the organization, all the people who are here uh, talking about this problem that it's an international problem. And I, I say it's a very, very uh, more than local, a global, global problem and intercultural problem. And I, I'm living in Italy and in the center of Italy. And I could say that we, we made a lot of, of surveys just to. Uh, to investigate uh, problems, uh, how this virus affect uh, our culture, our way of life, our habits. And I think that my suggestion, my point of view, uh, could focus on a specific area that's, as you, as you said, I'm interested in a school, you know? And so for me, community is not only family, you know? It's not only society. For me, community is a community of students. A community or, or teacher. So the main problem we, we, we tried not to solve, just to, to, to face them, is um, distance teaching. So I would like to, to arrive there, but I just very, very close to the problem that introduced the, the colleague in, in India. You know, our culture is very, very uh, effusive in a way. Can, can I say effusive? We are Italian in a way. So we, we, isolation just broke, you know, our tradition, you know, we are more, uh, we, we have a Italian culture, it's very effusive in a way, we are full of, of, of hugs, you know, or kisses and embrace, you know, you, you, maybe you, you know that we have uh, two kiss greetings. So isolation was the first main point that we had to face up as a as person. And I think this is very, very international, it's not very local. That's very for global, that's the world problems. But I think that's in Italy, in Italy, I mean, the north of Italy, especially Lombardia, Lombardia, sorry. The north of Italy was very hard, heated in, the, in this period. We have million of person in the world, but thousand in Italy. So uh, experts said us that, was the, you, do you remember that the slogan was united, uh, but distant? So maybe it was in, in the world, you know, as you could say united if you are distanced, you know. So we, we have a tradition, we, we started in, um, it was in February. Maybe we, if that, that's the video again, I, I can show you, but don't, don't worry actually if it's possible. Maybe you can, you can look on, on, on a web, on in YouTube if you want. But we have a special tradition, especially at six o'clock in the afternoon, in evening, sorry. Every evening at six o'clock, all the people just go outside on a balcony. You know what it's a balcony? It's the way to go out from your house, but you're locked in the house. So the only way to, to meet, the, the only way to, to make a, you know, a, a greet or a hug to other, other people was to go outside. And outside on the balcony, we have that tradition for more than one month. People were singing. 
people were talking, you know, from balcony to balcony. I think that's terrible. It was uh, was a very, very important for us just to, to, to maintain, just to have the, the sense of isolation, just face it in a distance. Then a second, a second words were very important for Italian culture, for our sense of community. It's that we, we the ability that we had to uh, to face, to to resist, to react positively to the isolation. So the sense of resilience, I think there's a, that's a, a, a more, more important for, for all the community. I think in Italy, we just um, forced our sense of resilience just to face that problem. And now we're in the second phase. So we, we, in a way we are trying to, to move to more freedom in a way. But the sense of resilience that we started and we just improved in that period, I think it's very important for the future. So we, we, we just kept a lot of, of energy. And, you know, if you are isolated in your house, you just have to give space to your, criteria, to your creativity. We have a lot of problems in your house. We have, we have a lot of problems with violence, to stay with kids, to stay with family, you know, we started a lot of problem in the house, but in a way resilience give, gives possibility to solve some of this problem. But I want to just to, to focus the problem of, no, when I say students, when I say um, teacher, when I say community or schooling, you know, I'm talking about how uh, the sense of social inequality the problem of equity in the school was very, very important this period because the difference, the background, the resource and the possibility, I know you, you, the only way to contact students, I mean, university and school and teacher was using technology. And a lot of survey, I mean, I'm talking about Italy, a lot of people doesn't have that resources. So they, they were afraid to, that this was impossible to connect with a lot of students. So what's happened to that students? This is not drop out. They are vanished, you know. One third of the students in Italy, not all in the South, everywhere spread in, in, in Italy, that were outside. So in a way, they could be um, happy in a way, you know, students. The work is finished, school was finished. But the, the, the contact, you know, the relation with teacher, with, the, with this friendship, you know, with the other students, where the sense of schooling, where the sense, the sense of instruction. So we lose a lot. And the sense and the social inequality, it's a very point that we have to solve. I mean, I mean, in Italy, I, and, I don't know what's happened outside, but, you know, uh, internet playing, you know, um, smart uh, techniques, how, how to connect with students. So how teaching distance, uh, solve problem relation. It's the third and the main problem we, we try to solve. I have one webinar each, every, every afternoon, you know, with students, teacher, just trying, you know, to make that contact real. But anyway, balcony, was the way, that's the windows to the world, you know, in Italy. It was a very, very important. If you have time, if you have seen something about, that's very, very typical of our, our culture. Go, go on the website, go on a YouTube, just type balconies, Italian balconies in, during the, the lockdown. And you will have a lot of experience, lovely. Okay, you have Italian music, of course, but people just met on, on and try to solve the sense of isolation and try to, to make that resilience more strong. Okay, Isha, I can go on, but I can give you an example and service about how it happened, but maybe in the discussion I'll go later. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I like the ending uh, with, with uh, reference to balconies in Italy. I had visited a couple of years ago. Uh, and it was definitely one of the things I, I adored most about, you know, both the Italian and, and Mediterranean 
culture. So, so thank you very much for, for bringing, you know, opening up the, the element of community to, to other areas. You know, you mentioned education centers and, and how we're going to distance uh, with social distancing and continue having an engaging and, and critical education uh, ability for, for all the students. Uh, and also touching upon, you know, singing hours and, and building up that resilience. Uh, especially as Italy was one of the initially one of the hardest hit countries uh, yeah. in Europe and, yeah. and it was definitely the perseverance was was an example I think for the rest of Europe and I, I remember I mean we, we were just just discussing before before going live you know you you had the uh, and lockdown a month before we did uh, in the UK so I mean your experiences are definitely uh, are, are an example uh, to us here in Europe, so, so thank you very much. Uh, yeah. can, now, I, can I add so, so only, only words? Of course. There was a, a lot, um, I, I think that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. During this period, not only on the balcony period, we just started with, I think it's an excessive sense of patriotism. Mm -hmm. I, I think we had to, to talk about it because the sense of our institution Mm -hmm. will increase in a way, increase a lot mm -hmm. uh, for sanitary, for uh, medical center and for, you know, also for civil protection. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of mm, problem with this, with the institution, you know, so mm -hmm. also to respect the real, you know, I think that's a, a good lesson just to, uh, to, 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 to understand how our culture needs rules rules needs protection mm -hmm. but in this period th there was excessive patriotism but i would like to have you know an, a new balance you know feeling with institution and feeling with the sense of real you know or the low okay yeah no no i think that's that's a nice addition which which will save to to the end because i mean i think in in this post lockdown era we we are going to be waking up to a sh shaken economy uh, across the globe and, and which feelings of patriotism I think are, are inevitable in, in those cases to increase. So how we balance it with the law and, and how we balance it with, with our community uh, engagements are important, but I will save it, save it to the end. Okay. Um, we, we are now off uh, to California to see Professor Deborah Dunn uh, at Westman College, uh, who, whose taught programs on conflict memory uh, pilgrimage to Northern Ireland, South Africa, Germany, Israel, Palestine, uh, and, and to the Comuno Santiago in Spain. Her research focuses on teaching grassroots peacemaking, uh, dialogue, and transforming conflict. She is also the co-director of the Westmount Initiative for Public Dialogue and Deliberation. So, so Professor Dunn, uh, the floor is now yours. Thanks so much. Good morning from Santa Barbara, California. And thank you um, to all of you for keeping these conversations going in these interesting times. And to the Dialogue Society, I appreciate your work and your hospitality. And I look forward to spending more time with you, hopefully face-to-face -face in the future. When we're doing our work and facilitating our community conversations, a key component of our approach comes from the National Issues Forums and the Kettering Model of Dialogical Deliberation. So we try to help people in these conversations to see what they hold valuable in the perspectives and the positions that they themselves are taking, as well as the perspectives and the positions that are held by the others at the table. And then when they get to deliberating specific actions, we structure dialogue so that they have to examine the tensions and the trade-offs in every potential action. So I think with COVID-19, we don't have to look very far to identify those values and tensions and trade-offs and how they mash together. So if we look at what makes one person's blood boil, seeing non-masked, non-distanced -distant, folks at bars and on beaches having the party of their lives versus what gets to another person, a store employee refusing entry or service without an appropriate mask or a state official ordering the shelter in place or the lockdown, and that gets them going. So you can see that clash right there. And I'd like to touch on a little bit about what we hold valuable 
and how that's become evident in this pandemic, as well as what we fear, and maybe talk a little bit about how this has sort of pulled the curtain back on some of the power inequities that many of us have shielded ourselves from and would like to shield ourselves from. So in terms of the values, we may all value things such as safety and security and freedom, but COVID-19 points out that we differ in terms of how we rank them. So one person might value their freedom and their independence more than their safety, and somebody else values their safety more than their freedom. That's easy to identify. Still, it's been quite a challenge for healthcare professionals, at least in this country, to get the word out that wearing masks is not so much about protecting our own individual safety, but about preserving and protecting the safety of others, especially those who are most vulnerable. Yet most debates that I see, especially in the media about masks are still boiling down to whether or not someone feels personally vulnerable to the virus and whether or not one feels that his personal rights are being violated. So I think we're lacking more sophisticated conversations about how we manage those tensions which leads me to another observation lacking some good conversation and that's about our fear. So we see that for some people, the scariest threat is getting sick or having a loved one get very sick or even die. For others, the scariest threat is losing their source of income and therefore their ability to maintain a roof overhead or food on the table. And when we're afraid, we can sometimes act selfishly, foolishly, irrationally. A couple of friends of mine recommended that I read Atul Gawande's book, Being Mortal, just before the pandemic hit. I read it because I'm living with the reality that I won't have my father much longer. One of Gawande's key themes, I think, is not just relevant for uh, family decisions about death and dying, but also about this pandemic right now. So one of his key themes is that the medical profession may help us literally live longer but it may not help us live the lives that we want to live. So in this pandemic, I see these tensions between fighting for a longer life versus fighting for what makes life meaningful. And maybe this gets some at Professor Benvenuto's issue about how do you deal with social isolation? So uh, we look at elderly in nursing homes who are particularly vulnerable. And of course, I think this pandemic also highlights a cultural difference that um, Americans appear to be treating their elderly quite differently than many other cultures around the world. But we have a lot of elderly who are in these nursing homes. And then of course we've had some real problems in some of the nursing homes. And so a lot of the nursing homes have just gone on a full on lockdown. And so you have elderly residents in the homes who now cannot have any visitors at all. But we know from research that loneliness and solitary confinement have dire physical and emotional consequences. So in order to protect our most vulnerable from the virus, we've separated them from society. But some say this cure is potentially far more painful than the disease. And for families with young children, several months without seeing a grandparent can mean the difference between a child remembering their grandparent or not. And of course, images we see on television of a nurse trying to help a family FaceTime with a loved one who's dying in hospital almost entirely alone is just heartbreaking. So I think that what we're lacking both in my country and in many others is that hard conversation where we weigh those tensions and trade-offs. When we weigh civil liberties and freedoms with our need for safety and security, weighing needs of the many versus needs of the few, and how to protect our most vulnerable. We need to have explicit conversations about how we manage those risks, but we can't take away from those individuals who are most at risk, their quality of life, their sense of being part of a human community. And I don't think we've done that well. We have to acknowledge that we're social beings. We need human company, we need human touch. So how can we figure out strategies that will help us be as safe as we can be while not depriving us of what it takes for us to not just feel human, but continue to live. If we know from research that social isolation actually shortens our lives. And as we muddle our way through this pandemic, we've also been made very aware of some fault lines in our society. 
those who have power and resources and those who don't. And this maybe gets at some of Professor Alam's observations. So many of our essential workers are also the poorest and therefore they have less freedom and flexibility to decide whether or not it's safe to work. They have to work if they want to live and they have to work in sometimes really unhealthy conditions and risk contracting the virus themselves or passing the virus on to their loved ones. If they speak up, they might be fired or sidelined, so they don't speak. And there's a reason why in many societies, from my own in the USA to Brazil, we see that infection, hospitalization, and death rates are higher in poor communities or minority communities, and that's not an accident. This inequality makes us less resilient. We are connected, so we have to connect our responses. And in this era of populism, nationalism, me first, we can't act as a larger global community well. And in my own country, the individuality of our culture, of our states, of our counties and local governments, in an era where we have so many global webs of connection, maybe don't make as much sense as they would have even decades ago. So we have to have those conversations as well about how do we balance these individual rights of various entities with larger projects that concern our safety and our freedom. But I think there are some good things, some hopeful things that I've observed. Most people I think are cooperative, helpful, even sacrificial. The number of people and the numbers of stories willing to run errands, to help neighbors, to do the shopping, to check in, to wear the masks, these are countless positive stories and we just can't see enough of them on our evening news or on our YouTube channels. And many communities, especially in California, we suddenly magically found beds for people who are living without homes. They may have been motel rooms or properly distanced shelter beds, but we found beds for people. And we provided hand washing and cleaning stations to prevent the spread of virus. The downside of this, it took a pandemic for us to realize we can act in this area. The good news though, is that we prove to ourselves we can do something. Where there is a public and a political will, there is a way to do these. And of course in the USA and elsewhere, in spite of these very tragic killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, the number of people who have taken to the streets encourages me that people still care about justice. People still care about human rights and people are willing to sacrifice their own safety for the safety of others. That gives me a lot of hope. So that's why I'm really grateful for all of you who are continuing to help your own communities have these conversations about things that matter, sometimes life and death matters, because I think when we see the humanity in each other, when we talk together, when we sit at a common table or a common Zoom and work out solutions together, we can change our communities and ultimately we can change our world. So I think the lessons we're learning right now are hard lessons and we need to have a lot better conversation about these lessons that we're learning. But I think if we have ears to ear, ears to hear and eyes to see, I think this can make us better people in the long run. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Professor, for, for your contribution too. Uh, it, was, it was quite a diverse area, you know, starting from, from the very tough, uh, more philosophical questions perhaps on, on how we perceive fear, power, equity, uh, and how we internalize these and, and prioritize them differently perhaps, or how we understand them perhaps differently as, as individuals, yet be we as individuals are, are still part of a society, are still part of a community, trying to work together. So it was nice seeing the diversity and then, and then trying to come together. Uh, you, you highlighted I mean, some, of, some of the difficulties that the US is having with, with the pandemic in terms of you know, the elderly community and, and nursing homes, as well as you know, the increased uh, protests uh, after the tragic murder of, of uh, several uh, black people in, in the US and how all these complex dynamics are, are coming together now, but within that and within the injustice, we see, we see people striving together for justice and, and for human rights and, and coming together and having these hard conversations, uh, which I think is vital too, and, and definitely for, for the topic today. 
Uh, you also mentioned the, the issue of, of social isolation as, as being an issue in the US. I mean, uh, it's, it's kind of titled differently here. In, in the UK, we, we refer to it as loneliness. Uh, but I mean, we have the government even on board trying to uh, implement different projects and, and supporting local communities to who, who are trying to deal with this issue. I mean, I think it's, it's, it was a significant issue and one of the largest issues we have in the UK too. Uh, and, and I think increasingly for a lot of Western societies where, where people are, are living longer uh, and, and we're having different dynamics uh, in, in family relations too. So there's, there's definitely a lot, a lot to, to bring into the conversation uh, at the end. So thank you very much, uh, Professor. Now we are on to Felix Kozai from uh, Tanzania, a journalist and media consultant with more than 50 years working with independent media. So Felix, I know we had some uh, technical difficulties, but I'm wondering if you've been able to... You're muted, Felix. Can, can we unmute you perhaps? No, we can't, can't hear you. But I don't think it's with your microphone. I think it's I think it's with the system on Zoom. Oops. Well, we're getting there. Uh, still not there yet, Felix. Perfect. I hello. think. Hello. Yes, we can hear you now. Hello. Hello. Is, it, is, it, uh, uh -huh. is that okay? Yes. Perfect. Now. Right. Perfect. Yes, okay. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you uh, for me to take part in the uh, debate. Um, first of all, you. It is better to know where the United Republic of Tanzania is. United Republic of Tanzania is on the western rim of the Indian Ocean in East Africa. Uh, it is the only uh, united country in the uh, world. We, the rest, uh, the, we, Tanzania is the founding member of the OAU, and um, now they transformed into the, the AU. Our population here is 60 million people made up of 120 tribes. And all of us are living like free molecules in the public national uh, harmony. To understand how Tanzania re, um, reacted to COVID-19, one has to consider our neighbors. That is Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, uh, with whom we formed the East African community together with the South Sudan. And it is a member of the Great Lakes region growing in the DRC Congo, together with the 15 other countries in the South and off the Indian coast, we, we formed the South African Development uh, Community, SADC. Now, with the question of outbreaks, um, Tanzania has been through many outbreaks, ranging from political, economic, to security and safety, and most, but mostly uh, as spillovers from our neighbors. Now, with the COVID-19, uh, this took us by surprise, like, just like anybody else. Um, Africa was driven into bigger fear with predictions of big boom big doom. I think the worst scare came from Melinda Gates' prediction of bodies lying on the streets in Africa. Those were the words from a mother and leader of a global philanthropy organization. The World Health Organization Director General, Dr. Tedros, an Ethiopian leader, told his African king, wake up and prepare for the West. He expressed worries over 
undetected and unreported cases across the continent. Some figures even suggested half a million deaths. By yesterday, June 16, at, 20, at 10, 10 GMT, I received authentic figures from Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, John Hopkins and um, the Novella Virus um, Africa. It revealed we have 2,290 200, confirmed cases in Africa, of which 114. 1,661 have recovered and 6,789 deaths. Tanzania's share is 509 confirmed cases, 183 recovered, and 21 deaths. Those catastrophic predictions have not come true. Irrevocably African leaders have got the response right despite their orchestrated poor health, infrastructure, and delivery systems. But how did this happen? Um, one, um, COVID-19 impact on Tanzania communities uh, is variable. When we had the negative impact, it caused the fear and then there was misinformation. For the first time in our history, uh, schools and institutions of higher learning were closed. Social gatherings were banned. We were told the disease, besides being highly contagious, had no medicine, at least for the time being. The impact was less incomes. Family breadwinners in the hospitality and the service industry in particular, and those who depend on social interaction had their means of livelihood threatened. If you read between the lines, uh, you, we see one negative impact as possible child abuse threat. Evidence abound that most of the child abuses in Tanzania are traceable to relatives. Now, the longer the stay at home environment raises the propensity of such malpractices. Another point is faith. Some religious, religious leaders decided to tune down uh, related activities because they draw people together. It all depends on what the effect this may have on the faithful after reducing their frequency and intensity of attending religious activities. Another um, possible negative effect is unplanned in pregnancies. Let us keep our fingers crossed. Nine months after they return uh, back to normal life, some families may be having unplanned babies standing around the corner. COVID-19 as also a positive side. We, at least we've managed to see equality happening. Generally, people have come to learn and they appreciate the fact that they are just the same human beings, their social status notwithstanding. COVID-19 did not choose between the billionaire and the street beggar, neither between the professor and the illiterate, neither between the young and the old. Although they allege, we old people are more allergic to uh, being taken up by COVID-19. The palace home or slum dwellers are all equal before the coronavirus. Coronavirus also brought some closeness. For the first time, I found myself coming closer to a neighbor to the extent of our family taking care of his sick wife in his absence, I had the time to communicate with the relatives living in Europe and the United States. I enjoyed spending more time with my grandchildren, engaging in closer relationship, building ex exercises, 
like having lunch together, uh, saying evening prayers together, and feeding the chicken, watering the garden, and exposing them more to the computer. This came with COVID-19. Now, there is one thing that we've got to learn, uh, or what other countries can learn from the Tanzania experience. On 12th of June uh, this year, I received a WhatsApp chat titled, nine countries in the world are COVID-3 now. The caption read, New Zealand, Tanzania, Vatican, Fiji, Montenegro, Seychelles, St. Kitts and Nevis, Timor-Leste, and Papua New Guinea. What was the magic of Tanzania? It's here that we come to the, the sequence of events that have led to what we have uh, seen taking place here in Tanzania. When the news of the coronavirus outbreak first hit the world headlines towards the end of last year, and even when some African countries had already come under the scourge, the government only assured the people that everything was under control. This sounded like a joke, but it wasn't. Way back in 2015, after the world was cautioned on the spread of Ebola, the government took measures that could be replicated in any outbreak. It instituted a policy of fever checking for all travelers arriving by air from affected and suspected areas. For this, it already bought and installed thermal scanners. It also established isolation facilities at the Mount Meru Hospital in Arusha, the hub of the Northern Tourism Circuit. So when the first case was reported at Arusha on 16th March this year, all that was required was to sensitize the people about the importance of washing their hands. On the 18th March, two new cases were confirmed, one in Dar es Salaam and another in Zanzibar, involving the US and German foreigners. Immediately, schools and universities were closed. Buses were ordered to operate on level seats. Public gatherings were prohibited. Health con contingencies procedures were announced. Four days later, the president himself had to come out and calm the people after the number rose to 12, including four foreigners. He declared the lockdown was not the Tanzania choice. He urged people to work hard, adhere to health standards, and pray to God. He said he could not close the Daslam Harbor, which is the lifeline for the economy of landlocked neighbor countries of Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, DRC, Malawi, and Zambia. On the whole, social distancing was not the choice either. Definitely not under circumstances of big families, overcrowded houses, and the closely knit communities. This led to a controversy and the accusations of Tanzania hiding facts behind the COVID-19 status. A deputy health minister was sacked. Two top executives in the National Health Lab were suspended. The president faulted testers and sus suspected a data game. As time would have it, institutions of higher learning have reopened. Schools and the other social activities resume with the effect from 29th June, uh, this June. Tanzania is one of the nine COVID free countries. The big lesson from Tanzania to the rest of the world government in the case of such outbreaks is to be original. There is no safety approach. Traditional medicine two rather than divorced medicine, because one is plant and finds a converging point for both health delivery disciplines. Now, how did Tanzania manage to get around all these problems? In the event of outbreaks, 
Tanzania has had the following enabling properties, all of which have a bearing on how it has shaped its response to COVID-19 pandemic. These are political will. There has got to be appreciation of a situation and making decision on it. The second leader's commitment to deliver the goods, no armchair leadership. The third is mass education, which takes care of individual society category needs. Then we have mass involvement. Nobody is left out on the production belts and consumption line. Finally, we have unity of purpose. Even if it somehow involves a little bit of individual pain or sacrifice somewhere, at home we call this belt tightening. That is what constitutes the Tanzania magic. Thank you for the listening to the COVID-19 impact from Tanzania down to earth level. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Felix, for both uh, the, the details on, on uh, Tanzania's place in, in the world, you know, with, with your very uh, tribal society and, and how you introduced, you know, uh, the neighbor countries as, as also, you know, perhaps having a, a role in, in community itself. Uh, you know, you both highlighted some of some of the possible difficulties and, and, and problems and problematic experiences of, of the virus and pandemic. So, you know, stemming from, you know, the closing of, of institutions, uh, possible, you know, child abuse, uh, the socioeconomic factors for many communities, uh, but also the positives, you know, the, the coming together as, as families and as you said, you know, being able to spend time with, with grandchildren. Uh, and also how Tanzania uh, was perhaps surprisingly for, for the rest of us across the world who, who wasn't ready and, and prepared for, for a pandemic uh, of, as having learned from uh, the previous Ebola experience, um, which, which of course we didn't have at the, at the same severity uh, in, in the rest of the world. So, so thank you very much for, for your contributions. We are now on to our next uh, speaker from... Uh, the University of Colombo, Professor Th Santi Kumar Hitokarachi, uh, who has education experience teaching uh, religious cultures with, with a critical approach and, and a cross-cultural approach, teaching with experience in both Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, and Buddhism. Professor, the, the floor is yours. Okay, Aisha, thank you. Uh, thank you for being associated once again with uh, Dialogue Society, particularly the one in Eastlington, because my association with you is a long one, uh, and I remember all the colleagues. <clears throat> now, I just want to be very brief with you. Uh, if you have time, maybe you have very restricted time. Uh, we are the two only South Asians in this context, uh, Professor Anwar Alam and myself, India and Sri Lanka. Um, I want to put myself uh, and all of us in context very briefly uh, that uh, we were not aware of this as much as any other person until in early February, we found a Chinese woman being infected and then only uh, in Colombo here, and then the health authorities uh, swiftly got involved in this and then quarantined her and then gave her sufficient uh, care and she was sent back to China. And uh, our access to the virus came through uh, the airport uh, with several people traveling because we have uh, a worker communities in Italy, particularly in northern Italy, including Lombardia, uh, and then South Korea. Those were our access to the local communities here. And then 
we have up till now 1940 uh, total and uh, our recovery rate is about 68 percent 1400 and uh, we have a uh, fatality rate um, 0.2 percent actually so only 11 people who have died uh, unfortunately and we have a very uh, we, they have systematized the the treatment and the handling of the entire case here in sri lanka we have 21 plus million people and uh, the country is in between a presidential election and uh, a general election so there is actually the legislature is uh, no longer exists it's the executive with a ad hoc cabinet that is functioning so at the outset the president declares a presidential task force headed by the tri forces the police and the health authorities so the presidential task force took the responsibility with health authority those who are in, well informed in this matter and then uh, those who are who have had the experience in uh, handling a 30 year old war with the tamil tigers were given almost like a second battle to handle so so far we have 54 quarantine centers right across the country with nearly 5,000 people. So there are no clusters in the country right now. So the ones who are coming as uh, infected individuals are those who are being quarantined in these 50 plus centers across the country. So there is no single person being infected by Corona virus in the community at all right now. And we have unlocked the system uh, for the last three weeks. But the economy is struggling. Um, it's not easy. You, you all know about it. Now, uh, that's uh, to put myself in context uh, with your context. And we right through felt, um, me as a teacher, and a community activist that we were isolated, but not alone. That's what we felt. Um, I returned after a long uh, research tour into United States, uh, uh, New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, plus UK. And I returned to the country on the 22nd of February. And I already felt uh, during my long journey, sojourn in this, and I felt isolated, but not alone because I knew where in the United States, in the state of New York, where the mass burial grounds was being prepared because I passed that just a week before. And I felt the feeling of Lombardia, where I have visited several times, particularly Brescia, north of Verona. And uh, my sense of community was not just necessarily of being Sri Lankan and being connected here, but also my sense of community was also my links and connections with the rest of the world. Isolated, but not alone. COVID was so sharp, so insidious, so intricate, it hit right, left, and center. And uh, uh, no one had experienced that. But having said that, in my view, it is unpreparedness and complacency, if at all, 
any country was deeply affected because it was also eating into the global politics and also local politics. So it was finally, coronavirus also was politicized deeply and shamefully from the rich countries to the poorer countries. I think Alam was right in what he was saying and the others too. And it had double jeopardy when Floyd's uh, unfortunate case came up, as Professor Dunn said. So all of this has affected the communities so deeply right now. And politics is at the nerve center of politicization of social issues are at the nerve center of this. And this is our challenge in the post-corona, if you want to say, or in devising new normal, if you want to say, uh, in discovering new community relations, if we care, and looking for communities uh, that are resilient. And uh, I think the virus pushed us to rethink, redesign, and then probably remake our world, not in the old fashion, not the old edition, but a new edition of the old book, probably. And it must be not in soft cover, but it must be in hard cover so that we will be a resilient communities right across the globe. And I thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Professor, uh, for your contributions and, and sharing the views uh, of Sri Lanka's unique experience, which I think is unique in the sense that you've had a much, much smaller scale uh, virus outbreak uh, and rapid quarantine in quarantine centers as, as you mentioned, however, perhaps within within the global culture that we have now, uh, as you mentioned, the virus itself was politicized, surrounding political and, and social issues have also become politicized. And, and perhaps as you mentioned, that this is going to be our new reality and, and how do we reshape our community relations, community links after this, and uh, as you suggested, maybe maybe with a more resilient re rethinking and resigning, redesigning uh, of, of community, so that's definitely something that, that we should bring up uh, in our discussion at the end. So uh, on, on to our next speaker uh, from Canada now, Professor Shirley Steinberg uh, at the University of Calgary, uh, who focuses on the cultural, social and educational development of youth uh, and critical involvement in society. And she's concerned with how society views young people uh, and actively works to create an environment in which youth are viewed as a pro positive democratic agents within society. Uh, so Professor Steinberg, the, the floor is now yours. Hi everyone, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are. How fabulous to be with such an international group of, of people who care and people who think and hopefully, uh, we make a difference or just entertain people for a few minutes. Um, I've been thinking, just listening, it's, you know, you walk into something and you think you know what you're going to say, but then you hear brilliant people say things and then you start to spring out into branches and thinking about uh, what matters in, in looking at what Deborah was talking about and the idea of what does matter. I think that's the, this last few months has made me wonder about what matters and things I thought mattered stopped mattering a lot and things mattered more. Uh, I kind of am big on letters and I evidently for some reason my mind works so when I thought of things everything started with a P. I didn't do this on purpose but it did but I kind of separated the the situation we've been in into three 
main categories that I resonated with and how I hope it shares with you. And that's the personal, the public and the pedagogical. And those are the three, three parts of me that I have reflected on this virus and this situation. Uh, I teach in Canada, but I was lucky enough for a time to be living uh, between New York City and Canada and uh, found myself with my partner in New York City when this happened. And because I am Canadian, we got in the car and quickly drove to Canada. And that made me ref reflect a lot on my personal decisions of becoming a Canadian as originally an American, deciding to be an expatriate and very thankful that I am. And also with the patriotic nature of that and the uh, amazing feelings of gratitude I have uh, to be in a country that I would describe as more gentle. And the notion of gent being gentle has been something that's sort of surrounded this virus and how do we accept situations? How do we look at them? Are we taking this in a gentle way or are we angry and have we fought this? And how do we achieve a, an ability to be at peace with ourselves? The notion crossing over into um, the personal about us thinking so much about life and many cultures putting death to the side. However, um, if you work in whiteness and racial studies, you realize that the whiter you are, the more you think you're gonna live longer. And I found that out very clearly. Um, but the notion that at my age, and depending on where we are in a vulnerable state, that death is something that it has become much more in my consciousness and watching how death has been, uh, attacked or ignored or received as gentle or received as terror. And the idea that the news media, especially in North America, seem to come up with this great epiphany that, oh, non-white people are dying more and getting sicker. And why are our black and brown communities in North America getting sicker? Like, like it was amazing that it took till 2020 for people to articulate this conversation, which of course most non-white people have known their whole lives. And the idea that, that we, have, we see the assumption that poverty or tragedy is often associated with non-white people, um, as a, a socioeconomic situation, when indeed it's, it's more about how one is treated, how one is acted upon when approaching uh, medical situations, uh, where one lives, than it does to how to do with what the paycheck is. So my personal and my political and my public has started to collide together in understanding that this is a, a time where people are Maybe they just have time to think about other people. And maybe that's what I'm seeing. Um, and then of course the public collided hugely for three or four weeks ago um, when the, the continuous systematic American murders of black men became a global highlight. And those of you in especially the UK or in the United States or Canada know that this has always been something that has happened. Um, and in a dominant cultural white society, we have, many of us have known this, but also um, the notion of articulation of racial identity and situations. And it's hard, I think, for some of us to not be angered or disgusted that, oh, you figured this out now, huh? But the reality is that, that we need to have a, a patience with those that are starting to grow and a, and a hope. And maybe that's another thing that grew out of this virus is the notion of hope. Uh, Paulo Freire talks about a, creating a pedagogy of hope. And unfortunately, in my cynical way of seeing the world, I've always been quite dubious about the notion of, of a pedagogy of hope. But it seems to me maybe that's all we have now is the notion of an ability to have that more gentle, hopeful world 
to be able to take ourselves out of ourselves and to truly become one of the universe. And especially those of us of a dominant culture in a dominant cultural society. I think that becomes very, very important. I also started to think about in the line of my three categories of the notion of need and want. And we all know in different countries, in different worlds, what we need and what we want is entirely different. I live in a country where Maslow's hierarchy of needs is rarely discussed. And the notion of need becomes uh, something that one buys, something that one owns, something that one ach achieves to get. And in our pedagogical, it becomes what can we reach to? What can we create? What can we publish? What can we be recognized for? There's all these kinds of wants and needs. In my life now, I see the virus as what I want is just entirely not part of life living. It's what one needs, um, a place to be safe, a place to be gentle and to create gen gentility, um, gentleness, uh, what matters? And that becomes something that, that I am hoping if something good comes from this, it's a reprioritization of our wants and needs. Uh, the idea that we are on Zoom, uh, which is exhausting in one sense, sometimes can be frustrating, but kind of is a blessing that we can all of us talk at the same moment, well, in, in asynchronatically, but that we can communicate that people in distant areas, uh, in my situation in the far north in the Arctic, uh, that can they can turn this on and be part of a collective universe. I see that as a as a good thing. Um, maybe it also tells us that we spend too much time spending money. I mean, I'm looking outside at my university and about six buildings are being blown up or torn apart to replace them. And they were only 40 or 50 year old buildings. Maybe that's a want and need question in a larger, a larger sense. What, sense. what is it we really do need as people who think and who write and who talk? What do our students need? How can we create a need fulfilling uh, role as a teacher or a professor or a colleague or a dialogic center uh, colleague? How do we become uh, truly dialogical and pedagogy in times of need, in times of stress, in times of fear? How do we treat that with gentility? I, I, I want to end in, in my thoughts about what I have learned about the, what has happened in the rioting and in the marching and in the horrendous political displays of fascist anger and force in our world in the last four weeks. And that is, we have to stop being shocked at what is happening and assume that we in this group, uh, I'm not talking about our families, but we are in this group who are talking because we are blessed to be who we are and to know people to network with. And we are in a situation of privilege because we have been allowed to be educated. We have been allowed to have a network that we are able to take ourselves out of the notion of shock and awe and understand that, that the world creates what it creates and we have to mold ourselves to it. Instead of that incredibly, uh, egocentric attitude that the world needs to mold itself around us and that we can work with our students and colleagues into creating this gentle need to understand what matters and what it is we need and what others need and replace that um, notion of want with the notion of need uh, in all three areas. Uh, I wish everyone my very best my heartfelt thanks of being part of this amazing uh, institute that is provided for us from London. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Steinberg. Um, you know, for for I think the nicely set three P's that you that you discussed the, the personal, 
public and, and pedagogical approach uh, to, to understanding the, the outbreak and, and its impact on, on our communities uh, and how, you know, you mentioned uh, eth ethnicity and, and, and racial inequality as, as something that's been recently highlighted, but something that has been going on uh, for centuries and, and people of colour uh, have been uh, oppressed and, and experiencing these in, in relation to health as well. Uh, I mean, it's something that we've we've seen uh, in the UK as well. People of uh, ethnic minority backgrounds being uh, impacted on a much larger scale from the virus, uh, and conditions of care too, uh, and, and rates of death, unfortunately. Uh, so, so then, bringing all those notions together in in the concept of a pedagogy, perhaps reshaping and, and restructuring our, our need want. Uh, environment and, and fostering it perhaps you know we're within our own um, privileged circles as you mentioned here you know being here amongst each other today discussing this on, on a global scale and, and how we bring our knowledge and our expertise and our experience together uh, with dialogue discussing it with others and, and bringing perhaps to reshape uh, a world post coronavirus so thank you very much uh, now we are on to our, our final speaker uh, of the day. Uh, last but not least, Prof Professor Alison Scott Bauman uh, from SOAS University of London. Uh, Professor Bauman is, is a Professor of Society and Belief uh, at the Centre of Islamic Studies in the Near and Middle East Department at SOAS. Uh, her work has two interrelated and also distinct research strands of social justice and philosophy. She also uh, applies her philosophy to social justice issues regarding Islam higher education and feminist debates. Uh, Professor Scott Malman, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to the Dialogue Society for your hospitality and your love and affection to the, to the British communities. I, I know you all well, and it's, it's, it's a great privilege to know you. I am here in due humility before you because I'm sorry to represent the nation that was too slow. It's great to hear Tanzania, Sri Lanka. Um, it's, uh, there's been a shocking loss of life in Britain. And I would suggest to you humbly from my position as an educationalist, that there's something in the curriculum that we could have helped the British government to understand and act faster and it's something for which SOAS is very famous, this idea of decolonizing the curriculum. It's a controversial term. A lot of members of parliament and members of the House of Lords would just say, oh yes, dear, thank you. Um, that's not for us. But if you think about it applied to the real world, if the British government had paid attention to what was happening in China, in January, and if the British government had thought, maybe we could learn from this, then maybe we wouldn't have one of the highest death tolls in the world. I think we're maybe third or fourth highest at the moment. So we have a very inexperienced government and they have made many mistakes. Decolonizing the curriculum is something about which students often feel very strongly, particularly at SOAS. And the idea of understanding people who you think are different to yourself, understanding that they are the same, that we are all the same, we all have the same needs, and we can learn from each other and teach each other things. This is a very simple construct. To that end, I'm also working with um, Westminster, I'm getting students and academics, I'm getting evidence-based research into the corridors of power. But it's tough because, um, as you probably know, a government in power doesn't necessarily, uh, it's not necessarily interested in evidence-based research. But it's exciting and it's a way of training up young community members who are also academics and researchers to do these things. I want to talk to you about a couple of other things, having given you my world apologies for the arrogance which um, 
Britain seems to be characterised by now at the moment. I'm very sorry about that. Two other things I just wanted to mention. One is that I do a lot of work with British Muslim communities. I have done for 20 years. And they are feeling both the fear and the torment and the terror of having to respond to instructions from a government they don't, they don't necessarily trust or feel comfortable with, but, and also the fear of the virus. But these communities are also faced with an understanding of their own, a, a need to self-reflect. So the Black Lives Matter movement has hit Muslim communities in Britain quite hard because it has made them look at their own racism. It's not only the white communities of Britain which are beginning to wake up to something that's been there for centuries, but it is also the Muslim communities I work with. And what's interesting about that is that because of lockdown, because they can't go to the mosque, there's a lot more online communication. The Friday prayers are being transmitted and there is self-reflection. But in British Muslim communities, there is also this understanding that they are still the bottom of the pile. And it's very interesting. I've got some research. Be, there's a big item on the Guardian, the Guardian newspaper coming out in a couple of weeks. This is a, the first report we've done. We did a big study over three years of Islam on university campuses. But I want to talk to you just a little bit about that today because it resonates sadly, tragically. It happens to be completely of the moment. I mean, the research was done in 2016, 17. But one of the striking findings that came out of this, we, we did a questionnaire with over 2000 students attending 132 universities. We also did in-depth ethnography. And we realized that one of the most startling, not startling to us, but the one of the most stark findings was, if you like, the epistemic wrong that was being done to many Muslim students and staff and other students and staff of color. Epistemic wrong in the sense that if they raised an issue or if they had a concern or a viewpoint that was a little bit off beam with the mainstream one, so they thought saw themselves as Muslim feminists, but they thought that was different from European feminism, difficult to talk about it in class. This epistemic wrong that was being done to them was that their opinions were not considered to be valid or interesting or important. And the tragic fact is that that now resonates very strongly with what has been coming out of COVID-19 with National Health Service doctors, nurses, care workers who have died in much larger numbers in Britain than those of other minority groups and certainly of the white population. And they have reported consistently over years and now maybe there's a little bit of listening going on, I'm not sure. You have to hope, you have to be optimistic. They have consistently reported again, what I'm calling this epistemic wrong, that when they raise an issue or there's a query or they want to identify a risk at work, it's not easy to be heard. So Britain is at a crossroads at the moment. We've got a very inexperienced government. They've just decided to not slash their international funding, but make it dependent upon their own strategic interests, which I think comes back to Alam's point right at the beginning about the idea of community. Britain has to be, has to understand itself as a player, as a participant in a global community, not as its own boss who can do what it likes. All these things are suddenly coming together and swirling around in the British consciousness the rise of the far right, all sorts of issues. But what I would leave you leave as my last contribution to this really exciting event is that we, we do have to accept, please accept that Britain still has a lot of really warm, compassionate people. We want to be part of the world community. We want to work together. Thank you.
thank you, Professor, for, for especially your, your last uh, sentence, which I think, I mean, us, us at the Dialogue Society, you know, as, as working uh, in Britain, uh, resonate and, and mirror uh, very strongly that, that we as the United Kingdom, you know, despite the, the various difficulties that we've had, you know, over the past few years, uh, with perhaps Brexit and, and other things too, that that bringing down to the core is that we are open and, and we are part of, of our global uh, communities. So thank you very much for that. And also touching upon uh, the kind of theme of decolonization, you know, something that, that I think uh, SOAS has led, but other universities are now uh, picking up on and trying to implement. Uh, but as you said, it's it's hard to get it through, through the doors of, of Westminster, but I think mm -hmm. The work that you're doing with young academics and students too to, to both you know have the experience of, of working in Westminster and also taking their own their own agenda with them uh, seems very empowering so, so I'd like to and I'm sure all our speakers would like to hear about how, how that plays out uh, in line with your research too that, that you mentioned you know, a three-year long study uh, I'm sure I'm sure it has many many more contributions that that the time restriction uh, hasn't allowed uh, as much. Uh, so thank you very much to all our speakers. We are slightly over after seven, um, but before concluding, I'd like to you know invite everyone uh, to make some final remarks. Perhaps you know touching upon on the issues that they raised uh, and how they resonate, contrast, you know, can learn from uh, other examples and other speakers too. So so please feel free. Uh, if, if there's anyone who would like to go first, just unmute yourselves. <laughs> the, the, the awkward silence. <laughs> a lot to think about. We've got a lot yeah. to think about. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I made notes as, as we were talking through and, and the discussions came up, so I think, I think the themes of, of uh, patriotism, nationalism, community and, and learning from po past experiences, which I think Tanzania and Sri Lanka, you know, uh, definitely countries that we haven't heard in the media, but but with, with the statistics that they've provided uh, have, have shone a light and example. Okay, thank, thank you very much to all our speakers for your valuable contributions. Uh, good evening, good morning, good, good afternoon to, to wherever you're from. Uh, thank you for being here with us today for your valuable contributions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you very much, Aisha. Bye. Thank you, Aisha. Yeah, thank you, Aisha. Thank you, Dialogue.